The limit point of capitalist equality, notes toward an abolitionist anti-racism by Chris Chen. This is from a journal called Endnotes, um, the third issue specifically. Without, without an account of the relationship between race and the systematic reproduction, reproduction of the class relation, the question of revolution as the overcoming of entrenched social divisions can only be posed in a distorted and incomplete form. And without an understanding of the dynamics of racialization, from capitalism's historical origins in primitive accumulation to the U.S. state's restructuring in the post-World War II era, continuing struggles against evolving forms of racial rule can only be misrecognized as peripheral to an ultimately race-neutral conflict between capital and labor. Rather than waning with the decline of what is something cons what is sometimes construed as a vestigial system system of folk beliefs, resistance to racial subordination in the U.S. has continued. Race has not withered away; rather, it has been reconfigured in the face of austerity measures and an augmented post-racial security state, which has come into being to manage the ostensible racial threats to the nation posed by black wages life, Latino immigrant labor, and Islamic terrorism. Through race, black chattel slavery in the United States constituted free labor as white and whiteness as unenslavability and unalienable property. The formal abolition of slavery has subsequently come to define the American achievement of what Marx called double freedom, the freedom of forcible separation from the means of production, and the freedom to sell labor power to the collective class of owners of those means. However, race doesn't simply complicate any periodization of the historical origins of capitalism. It was the protagonist of a global array of national liberation, anti-apartheid, and civil rights movements in the mid-20th centuries. Or mid-20th century, a planetary anti-racist offensive called into question nearly four and a half centuries of racial common sense and largely discredited white supremacy as explicit state policy. Race has been reconfigured in response to this world historical anti-racist upsurge and continues to exist as a body of ideas, but also as a relation to, of domination inside the inside and outside the wage relation reproduced through superficially non-racial institutions and policies two dynamics have reproduced race in the US since the mid 20th century anti-racist movements first economic subordination through racialized wage differentials and superflu superfluization and second, the racializing violence and global reach of the penal and national security state. Most contemporary ascriptive racialization processes are to a great extent politically unrepresentable as race matters because they have been superficially coded as race neutral. Disciplinary state apparatuses, for example, defined through discourses of national security threats, illegal immigration, and urban crime. Without an understanding of the structuring force of race in U.S. foreign policy and as a driver of the rise of the U.S. carceral state in response to the end of legal segregation, one can have only a partial understanding of the institutional fusion and seemingly unlimited expansion of police and military power over the last 40 years. The anti-racist critiques of recent social movements like Occupy Wall Street and the consolidation of opposition under the banner of a politics of decolonization illuminate a major fault line in U.S. political life, cleaving a political or cleaving a pol politics of race from a politics of class. The intellectual polarization between these two political formations has revealed the inadequacy of both Marxist approaches to class and theories of race couched in an idiom of cultural difference rather than domination. <clears throat> Overlapping with, yet conceptually distinct from, class, culture, caste, gender, nation, and ethnicity, 
race is not only a system of ideas, but an array of ascriptive racializing procedures which structure multiple levels of social life. Despite its commitment to challenging racial ideology as the assignment of differential value to physical appearance and ancestry, much anti-racist analysis and practice continues to treat race as a noun, as a property or attribute of identities or groups, rather than as a set of ascriptive processes which impose fictive identities and subordinate racialized populations. To distinguish racial ascription from voluntary acts of cultural identification and from a range of responses to racial rule from flight to armed revolt requires a shift in focus from race to racism. But focusing on the phenomenon of racism tends to narrow the terrain upon which race is structurally enforced to personal attitudes or, it, or racial ideologies rather than institutional processes which may generate profound racial disparities without requiring individual racist beliefs or intentions. As a result, race gets theorized in divergent cultural or economic terms as evidence of the need to either affirm denigrated group identities or integrate individuals more thoroughly into capitalist markets momentarily distorted by individual prejudice. On the one hand, race is a form of cultural stigmatization and, mi and misrepresentation requiring personal, institutional, and or state recognition. On the other, race is a system of wage differentials, wealth stratification, and occupational and spatial segregation. Whether defended or derided by critics across the political spectrum, the concept of racial or cultural identity has become a kind of proxy for discussing race matters in general. Conversely, dismissals of identity politics grounded in functionalist or epiphenomenalist <laughs> accounts of race propose an alternative socialist and social democratic politics of class based upon essentially the same political logic of affirming subjects, i.e. workers, within and sometimes against capitalism. This division between economic and cultural forms of race naturalizes racial economic inequality and transforms the problem of racial oppression and exploitation into either an epiphenomenon of class or the misrecognition of identity. Both the cultural and economic stratification theories have tended to frame racial inequality as fundamentally a problem of the unequal distribution of existing privilege, power, and resources, while continuing to posit the economy as fundamentally race neutral or even as an engine of racial progress. A dearth of materialist analyses of the bundle of ascriptive and punitive procedures organized under the sign of race has meant that critics from across the political spectrum have continued to downplay the severity and extent of racial domination organized by putatively colorblind social institutions. Saddled with discourses of meritocratic racial uplift, race continues to be represented either as a cultural particularity or as a devi deviation from colorblind civic equality. In either case, race is articulated in terms of real or illusory difference from a political or cultural norm rather than as a form of structural coercion. If race is thus understood in terms of difference rather than domination, then anti-racist practice will require the affirmation of stigmatized identities rather than their abolition as indices of structural subordination. Formulating an abolitionist anti-racist racism would require imagining the end of race as hierarchical assignment rather than a denial of the political salience of cultural identities. Race here names a relation of subordination. The conceptual elision of the difference between racial ascription and individual and group responses to racial interpolation is endemic in much of the literature either denouncing or defending a politics of identity. From the point of view of emancipation, a social order freed from racial and gender domination would not necessarily spell the end of identity as such, but rather of ascriptive processes so deeply bound up with the historical genesis and trajectory of global capitalism that the basic categories of collective sociality would be transformed beyond 
recognition. A precipitous 21st century decline in the U.S. labor share of business income and the transition to austerity has completely altered the terrain, the stakes, and the chances of success for not only the American labor movement, but all contemporary anti-racist political struggles as well. The, le the legacy of racial and gender exclusions which have structured the U.S. labor movement has been steadily eroded at the same time that the relative size and strength of organized labor has dwindled. Because the public sector, with, with its robust anti-discrimination -dis mandates, represents the last bastion of U.S. organized labor, hostility to the U.S. labor movement is frequently couched in racist rhetoric. As Kyriakides and Torres argue, 1960s era visions of a third world non-aligned or anti-colonial coalitional subject in the U.S. have, in any age of declining growth, fractured into multiple ethnically determined subjects of identity and competition, not only for a shred of an ever-shrinking economic settlement, but for recognition of their suffering conferred by a nation state in which the right won the political battle and the left won the culture war. Addendum on terminology. Race has been variously described as an illusion, a social construction, a cultural identity, a biological fiction, but social fact, and an evolving complex of social meanings. Throughout this article, race appears in quotation marks in order to avoid attributing independent causal properties to objects defined by ascriptive processes. Simply put, race is the consequence and not the cause of racial ascription or racial, racialization processes, which justify historically asymmetrical power relationships through reference to phenotypical characteristics and ancestry. Substituted for racism, race transforms the act of a subject into an attribute of the object. I have also enclosed race in quotation marks in order to suggest three overlapping dimensions of the term. As an index of varieties of material inequality, as a bundle of ideologies and processes which create a racially stratified social order, and as an evolving history of struggle against racism and racial domination, a history which has often risked reifying race by revaluing imposed identities, or reifying racelessness by affirming liberal fictions of atomistically isolated individuality. The intertwining of racial domination with the class relation holds out the hope of systematically dismantling race as an indicator of unequal structural relations of power. Race can thus be imagined as an emancipatory category, not from the point of view of its affirmation, but through its abolition. One, a brief history of racial subordination from limpieza de sangre to global superfluity. The trajectory of racial domination from slavery to racialized surplus populations traces a long historical arc between the colonial creation of race in 16th century Spanish notions of purity of blood in Pieza de Sangre and its structural reproduction under a restructured global capitalism, a history which can only be briefly sketched here. The genealogy of race and its precursors can be traced back to the spatial expansion of European colonialism, from the Baroque racialized caste system of Spanish and Portuguese colonial administrations to the later more Manichaean racial order produced by the British colonization of the Americas, Africa, and Asia. The extermination, enslavement, or colonization of racialized populations, often at the hands of a colonial class of indentured servants, consolidated race through the waning of European servitude and the emergence of black chattel slavery. This was the flip side of what Marxists call proletarianization. Marked by ongoing histories of exclusion from the wage and violent subjugation to varieties of unfree labor, racialized populations were inserted into early capitalism in ways that continue to define contemporary surplus populations. The cursory treatment of racial violence in the historical narration of primitive accumulation remains a fundamental blind spot in Marxist analyses 
of the relationship between race and capitalism. In the era of the conquista and in the transition to capitalism, race came into being through plunder, enslavement, and colonial violence. At the very same time, primitive accumulation in England produced a dispossessed and superfluous ex-peasantry, for the factory system that might absorb them had not yet been created. Many of these ex-peasants were eventually sent to the colonies or inducted into imperial enterprises, the navy, merchant marines, etc. In the 18th and 19th centuries, more of these surplus populations were integrated into the developing capitalist economy, whether as chattel slaves or as wage laborers, according to an increasingly intricate typology of race. Finally, after decades of compounding increases in labor productivity, capital began to expel more labor from the production process than was absorbed. That, in turn, produced yet another kind of superfluous population in the form of a disproportionately non-white industrial reserve army of labor. At the periphery of the global capitalist system, capital now renews race by creating vast superfluous urban populations from the close to one billion slum dwelling and desperately impoverished descendants of the enslaved and colonized. In the 21st century, in the, in the 21st century, the substantial overrepresentation of racialized US groups among the unemployed and underemployed, last hired and first fired, demonstrates the concessionary, uneven incorporation of these groups into a system of highly racialized wage differentials, occupational segregation, and precarious labor. As capital sloughs off these relative surplus populations in the core, the surplus capital produced by fewer and more intensively exploited workers in the global north scours the globe for lower wages and reappears as the racial threat of cheap labor from the global south. In the U.S., with the end of secure wage labor and the withdrawal of public welfare provisions, a massive post-racial security state has come into being to manage the supposed civilizational threats to the nation by policing black wageless, wageless life, deporting immigrant labor, and waging an unlimited war on terror. The catastrophic rise of black mass incarceration, the hyper-militarization of the southern U.S. border, and the continuation of open-ended security operations across the Muslim world reveal how race remains not only a prob probabilistic assignment of relative eco economic value, but also an index of differential vul vulnerability to state violence. Two, reading white supremacy back into the base. While Marx and Engels generally insisted on the need for workers to oppose racism in its more blatant 19th century manifestations, they did not attempt to articulate the relation of race and class as a, at a categorical level. As Derek Sayer, Sayer observes, Marx was a man of his time and place. Like most other Victorians, Marx thought both race and family, and family natural categories even if subject to some historical modification, and had little trouble in distinguishing between civilization, which for him was white, Western, and modern, and barbarism. His views on the beneficial results of European colonialism would em embarrass many 20th century Marxists, notwithstanding his denunciations of the violence of its means. The theoretical relation between race and class has subsequently become the subject of a long debate in the varieties of academic Marxism that emerged as a new left generation inspired by the struggles of the 60s entered the university. In an early and influential contribution to this conversation, Stuart Hall asserted that race was the modality in which class is lived, the medium through which class relations are experienced, the form in which it is appropriated and fought through. Hall and other cultural theorists supplemented Marxist categories of base and superstructure with the ideas of Western Marxist figures such as Louis Althusser and Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci in particular and his development of the concept of hegemony, with its room for more nuanced theories of culture, ideology, and politics, has been a central reference in academic attempts to rearticulate the relation of race and class,
In this vein, anti-racist struggle is viewed as a contest for democratic hegemony, which followed from the mid-20th century discrediting of white supremacy as explicit state policy. Until recently, the Gramscian analytic of hegemony, which has informed both Marxist cultural theory and many highly influential critical accounts of race and slavery, has largely gone unquestioned. Recent critical writing by Frank Wilderson, part of a group of contemporary theoreticians of black politics, whom Wilderson has broadly labeled Afro-pessimist, including Sadia Hartman, Hortense Spillers, Jared Sexton, and Joy James, sharply challenges the appropriateness of this Gramscian framework. Wilderson assesses the limits of a political economy of race centered on wage work rather than on direct relations of racial violence and terror, from black chattel slavery to black mass incarceration. In contrast to a Marxist perspective that focuses on the struggle around the wage, or around the terms of exploitation, Wilderson identifies the despotism of the unwaged relation as the engine that drives anti-black racism. Wilderson presents a devastating critique of the relevance of a Gramscian analysis of hegemony for understanding structural anti-black violence. For wilderness, it is the, or for Wilderson, it is the focus on the wage which leads to the inability of Marxism to conceptualize gratuitous violence against black bodies. A relation of terror as opposed to relation to a relation of hegemony. Wilderson is right to point out that the privileged subject of Marxist discourse is a subaltern who is approached by variable capital, a wage. This is because access to the wage was a prerequisite for both labor and later identity-based civil struggles after the end of legal segregation throughout the 20th century. From the point of view of the classical workers' movement, racism was thus seen as an unfortunate impediment to a process of progressive integration into an expanding working class. Yet it is precisely the racialization of the unwaged, unfree, and, ex and excluded which constitutes civil society as a space where recognition is bestowed via formal wage contracts and abstract citizenship rights for its members. Thus, for Wilderson, the black subject reveals Marxism's inability to think white supremacy as the base. Against a Gramscian reading of Marx, with its aff affirmationist focus on wage labor, value form theorists provide an alternative framework for charting the complex interplay between direct and indirect forms of domination. If capital is first and foremost an indirect or impersonal form of domination, unlike black chattel slavery or feudalism, for example, in which production relations are not subordinated to direct social relations, there's no necessary incompatibility between this and the persistence of growth of direct overt forms of racial and gender domination. At play here are not only unwaged, coerced, or dependent forms of labor, but also crucially the management of those populations, which have become redundant in relation to capital. Such populations are expendable, but nonetheless trapped within the capital relation because their existence is defined by a generalized commodity economy, which does not recognize their capacity to labor. The management of such populations could be said to be form determined by the capital relation without being subsumed by it. The form determination theory of the state may also help overcome some of the limits of a Gramscian view of the state as an object over which contending social forces struggle to gain control. From the state derivation debate of the 1970s, there emerged an alternative view of the state as a particular manifestation of the capital relation. Constituted by the separation of the indirect impersonal relations of production from direct political power, Thus, the state, with its expanded penal or carceral capacities, can impose direct relations of racial domination while, the, while, for instance, involving itself in the disciplinary regulation and expulsion of immigrant labor. In those relations mediated by free exchange, where wage labor as a commodity is traded, the state is obliged to ensure the terms of exchange and co contract while unwaged relations put one or both parties in the relation potentially outside 
or beyond the law. The increasingly punitive criminalization of the purchase, sale, and transformation or transportation of illicit drugs provides perhaps one of the most infamous examples of a racialized and racializing informal economy fundamentally structured by state violence. Women's formal legal st status as chattel vis-a-vis -vis marriage offers another in which women did not traditionally have protection from their husbands within the law, but only protection from men who were not their husbands. The limited protection of this legal status as chattel was revoked in the case of black domestic laborers in order to rationalize widespread rape and sexual exploitation by white male employers. In either case, the racial division of both productive and reproductive labor consistently maintains racial hierarchies within gender categories and gender hierarchies within racial categories. The workers movement with its valorization of wage labor work and the worker as the subject of history failed to grasp that wage labor is not the only stable form of exploitation on the basis of which capitalists can profit. Capitalism has not only proven fully compatible with unfree labor, from slavery, indentured servitude, convict leasing, and debt peonage, to gendered forms of homework and unwaged reproductive labor, it has required the systematic racialization of this labor through the creation of an array of effectively non-sovereign raced and gendered subjects. These modes of exploitation are not destined to disappear with the expansion of capitalist social relations around the world, e.g. through the massive campaigns of independent states in Africa, Latin America, and Asia to subjugate local, local populations to projects of industrialization. Instead, they are reproduced through the creation of caste-like surplus populations, deserted by the wage but still imprisoned within capitalist markets. Race is not extrinsic to capitalism or simply the product of specific historical formations, such as South African apartheid or Jim Crow America. Likewise, capitalism does not simply incorporate racial domination as an incidental part of its operations, but from its origins systematically begins producing and reproducing race as global surplus humanity. As Marx famously noted, the basis for primitive accumulation requiring the dispossession of the peasantry in England and Scotland lay in New World plantation slavery, resource extraction, and the extermination of non-European populations on a world scale. The discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in mines of the Aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins signalized the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. These idyllic proceedings are the chief moment of primitive accumulation. On their heels treads the commercial war of the European nations with the globe for a theater. It begins with the revolt of the, Never the Netherlands from Spain, assumes giant dimensions in England's anti-Jacobin war, and is still going on in the opium wars against China. While non-racially determined varieties of slave labor predated the European colonial age of discovery, capitalism bears the unique distinction of forging a systematic racist doctrine from the 16th to 19th centuries, culminating in 19th century anthropological theories of scientific racism to justify racial domination, colonial plunder, and an array of racially delineated varieties of unfree labor and unequal citizenship. The history of capitalism isn't simply the history of the proletar proletarianization of an independent peasantry, but of the violent racial domination of populations whose valorization as wage labor to reverse a common formulation has been merely historically contingent, socially dead, African slaves, the revocable sovereignty and terra nullius of indigenous peoples, and the nerveless supernumerary super body of the coolie laborer. Racial disparities have been reported as an inherent category of capitalism since its origins not primarily through the wage, but through its absence. 
the initial moment of contact between a European colonial order and an unwaged racialized outside capital has been progressively systematized within capitalism itself as a racialized global division of labor and the permanent structural oversupply of such labor, which has produced 1 billion city dwellers who inhabit postmodern slums. Insofar as labor markets organize the ratio of paid to unpaid labor, race as a marker of economic subordination is grounded both in a permanently superfluous population and entrenched racialized wage differentials. The expulsion of living labor from the production process places a kind of semi-permeable racializing boundary bifurcating production or productive and unproductive populations even within older racial categories, a kind of flexible global color line separating the formal and informal economy and waged from wageless life. Though this wageless color line is minimally permeable and explicitly racial and explicit blah, blah, blah. Though this wageless color line is minimally permeable and explicit racial criteria are no longer formally sanctioned, the material reproduction of racial domination, including the proliferation of international non-white ethnic hierarchies, is grounded in intertwined processes of exclusion from the wage, the increasing criminalization of informal economies, and elevated vulnerability to state terror. Three, racial domination after the racial break. What Howard Winant and Michael Olmey have called the racial break or great transformation driven by a world historical anti-racist upsurge of decolonization, civil rights and anti-apartheid social movements in the mid 20th century has discredited white supremacy as explicit state policy across the globe. For Olmey and Winant, racial domination has given way to the struggle over racial hegemony and coercion has given way, has given way to consent. But 50 years after the racial break, racial domination has also evolved. Many ostensibly post-colonial states have resorted to racial violence and ethnic cleansing in the name of nation building and economic development. After the racial break, capital and race intertwine both inside and outside the wage relation. Insofar as labor markets organize the ratio of paid to unpaid labor, Race as a marker of economic subordination is grounded both in a permanently superfluous population and entrenched wage differentials. After the repeal of most Jim Crow laws and racialized, ra racialized national immigration restrictions, two anti-racist political orientations emerged. The case, in the case of U.S. Black freedom struggles after World War II, persistent racialized wage differentials and racial discrimination in housing, education, and credit markets became the target of a late civil rights movement politics of, of equitable, equitable inclusion and electoral representation. At the same time, racial exclusion from the wage, de facto segregation in ghettos and exposure to systemic police violence made state institutions like welfare, prisons, and policing the target of a black feminist welfare reform movement, waves of ghetto and prison riots, and a more militant politics of self-defense and self-assertion. Since the attacks of September 11, 2001, popular U.S. stereotypes of the relative economic productivity of racial subgroups have justified the exposure of such groups to state surveillance, policing, or incarceration, from border patrol shootings of illegals to black mass incarceration. At the same time, the post-racial civilizing mission of the U.S. and its prosecution of a multi-trillion dollar military campaign across the Islamic world has been vouchsafed by a national mythology of the progressive overcoming of the legacy of slavery and legal segregation. The changing relationship between the U.S. state and superfluous domestic populations highlights the global foundational role of state violence as a racialization process. The role of the state itself as an ostensibly neutral agent of racial reform rather than the principal agent of racial, racial violence provides the missing third term in theorizing the relationship between race and capital. Contemporary U.S. racial politics is fundamentally structured by the decline of U.S. global ec economic hegemony 
and by the hyper-militarization of a post-racial security state in response to three racialized civilizational threats, the criminal threat of Black surplus populations, the demographic threat of Latino immigrant labor, and the unlimited national security threat posed by an elastically conceived Islamic terrorist menace whose adherents are subject to collective punishment, torture, and preemptive eradication. All three are directly targeted and, and racialized by the state's penal, citizenship conferring, and domestic security institutions. The rise of the anti-Black U.S. carceral state from the 1970s onward exemplifies rituals of state and civilian violence, which enforce the racialization of wageless life and the racial ascription of wagelessness. From the point of view of capital, race is renewed only not only through persistent racialized wage differentials or the kind of occupational segregation posited by earlier split labor market theories of race, but through the racialization of unwaged surplus or superfluous populations from Khartoum to the slums of Cairo. Four, race and surplus humanity. The colonial and racial genealogy of European capitalism has been encoded directly into the economic base through an ongoing history of racial violence, which structures both unfree and informal labor and which binds surplus populations to capitalist markets. If superfluity, superfluity, stratification, and wage differentials are deracialized and the racial content of such categories rendered contingent, then race can only appear as epiphenomenal and possess a de facto specificity, which severs any causal link between capitalism and racialization. The racial typologies which emerged from and enabled the spatial expansion of European capitalism as a mode of production have been renewed over the course of centuries by an imminent tendency within capitalism to produce surplus populations in ghettos, slums, and favelas throughout the world. After the mid-20th century, racial break, formal decolonization in places like Brazil, sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia left in its wake developmentalist states which absorbed ideologies of industrialization and so also racialized ind indigenous populations, ethnic groups, and stigmatized castes as peripheral to the wage relation. Such populations will never be fully integrated into capitalist accumulation processes except as bodies to be policed, warehoused, or exterminated. In the U.S., the post-war Keynesian state's grudging extension of public social provisions to non-white communities in the 1960s has now been withdrawn and largely replaced by carceral and state-mandated work regimes applied to disposable populations who inhabit the politically unre unrepresentable dead zones of raced, gendered, and sexualized poverty. The only alternative to low-wage, precarious service work for these populations is a criminalized informal economy abutting America's vast carceral system. The U.S. in particular has served as a global model for a new government of social insecurity founded on a punitive upsurge in surveillance, policing, and incarceration in response to the disappearance of secure wage work. Race is thus rooted in two overlapping processes of allocation and control. Past and present racial discrimination is cumulative and distributes precarity, unemployment, and informality unevenly across the economy along race and gender, gender lines. But race is also operationalized in various state and civilian political projects of social control, which classify and coerce deserving and undeserving fractions of various racial groups while determining their fitness for citizenship. Eroding the institutional separation between policing, border securitization, and global warfare, a massively expanded security state now sends one in three black men to prison in their lifetime, deports nearly half a million undocumented immigrants annually, has exterminated anywhere from 100,000 to over a, b a million civilians in Iraq alone, and is now gearing up for a $46 billion dollar 
border surge, which includes drone surveillance and biometric exit scanning. 21st century race emerges from this matrix of securitization. Five, the trouble with class, class politics as identity politics. As, as a rhetoric of racial diversity has been used increasingly to conceal or even justify deepening economic inequality, recent theorists from Slavoj Žižek and Ellen Mikesons Wood to Walter Ben Michaels contend that what they call multi, multinational or neoliberal capitalism has come to champion a politics of race against a politics of class. For these critics, identity-based social movements and liberal multiculturalism in particular is at best indifferent and at worst hostile to what Michaels considers the more urgent problem of class inequality. Conversely, anti-racist theorists from Howard Winnant to David Theo Goldberg have argued tirelessly for the irreducibility of race to political economy. The institutionally reinforced division between anti-racism and Marx Marxism has a long history. It has been a commonplace, a commonplace of recent popular historical accounts of the political tra trajectory of the 1960s era New Left to blame the fragmentation of a unitary revolutionary class subje subject on the emergence of various anti-racist struggles from U.S. ethnic nationalisms aligned with mid-20th century African and Asian anti-colonial movements, to Black feminist critiques of the centrality of white heterosexual middle-class women's experiences in second-wave feminism, to what both liberal and conservative critics have lamented as the rise of a balkanizing identity politics. The intellectual polarization of theoretical traditions which address either race or class could be termed the unhappy marriage of anti-racism and Marxism. In the latter half of the 20th century, with the waning of the third worldist, Maoist, Guavarist, or world systems Marxist analyses of race and colonialism, and of bodies of writing aligned with and informed by mass anti-capitalist and anti-racist political movements, academic theorists have invoked Marx to reread race as historical contingency. Race typically persists in academic Marxist discourse as a social division internal to the working class and sown by economic elites in order to drive down wages, fragment worker insurgency, and create the permanent threat of a non-white reserve army of labor. In these accounts, race becomes a functional or derivative component of class rule. This functionalist or class reductionist account of race has been thoroughly challenged by anti-racist scholars over the last half century. Yet these challenges have customarily emphasized the irreducibility or relative autonomy of race as one among many equivalent through entangled systems of domination, which can be simply super added to class. In turn, both Marxist and anti-racist theories assert through for though for vastly different reasons, that there is no constitutive relation between race and capitalism. Sweeping critiques of identity politics or of liberal, liberal multicult, multicult, blah, blah, blah. sweeping critiques of identity politics or of liberal, liberal multiculturalism as neoliberal mystification conceal a deeper elision of the identitarian logic at work in a socialist and social democratic politics of class. The classical workers' movement, with its concept of class consciousness, was premised upon a dream that the widespread affirmation of a working class identity could serve as the basis for workers' hegemony within nationally constituted zones of capital accumulation, and so also for a workers' revolution. Like much contemporary anti-racist scholarship, the Marxist critique of identity politics typically remakes capitalism as a problem of identity, specifically of class identity, and reduces structural exploitation to distributive inequalities in wealth. Labor and identity-based struggles assume to be qualitatively different in such accounts, 
are in fact structured by the same representational logic of affirming identities within capitalism. The difference that constitutes class as an identity, Ellen Megson's Wood writes, is by definition a relationship of inequality and power in a way that sexual or cultural difference need not be. The working class as the direct object of the most fundamental and determinative, though certainly not the only, form of oppression, and the one class whose interests do not rest on the oppression of other classes, can create the conditions for liberating all human beings in the struggle of li the struggle to liberate itself. This argument from Wood highlights three interrelated problems of framing the interaction between systems of racial, gender, and economic domination, which plague both Marxist critiques of identity politics and contemporary theories of racial difference. If for Wood, race, gender, and sexuality are def definitionally non-racial or non-economic categories, okay, if for Wood, race, gender, and sexuality are definitionally non-economic categories of social life which index economic inequality only contingently, then it is simply a tautology that these identities are not constitutive of capitalism as such. The abolition of sexual or racial domination, here understood primarily as vestigial forms of historical injustice, therefore would not in principle be incompatible with capitalism. Finally, the reasoning goes, the qualitative difference between class and other forms of identity rests on the face or on the fact that class identity cannot be celebrated. And yet the argument elides a fundamental contradiction between the abolition of class inequality and an implicit agent of emancipation in the figure of the working class. While poverty may not be a form of difference which can be celebrated, would nevertheless produces an implicitly affirmationist account of the working class as the, social, blah, 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 as the social agent both responsible for and uniquely capable of ending capitalism. The question of how the affirmation of such an identity could bring about the end of class oppression without simply reaffirming capitalism under the guise of worker self-management is passed over in silence. Despite the attempt to criticize the logic of identity-based struggles, Wood ultimately offers what I want to call an affirmationist politics of class structurally indistinguishable from similarly affirmationist accounts of race and gender difference. But what if we did not center anti-racist struggles on difference, but on domination? To understand race not as a marker of difference, but as a system of domination poses the question of the material abolition of race as an indicator of structural subordination. Both anti-racist critics of class reductionist Marxisms and Marxist critics of liberal reformist merely, merely cultural anti-racisms gloss over the strategic similarities between the increasingly desperate defensive struggles of the U.S. labor movement and the race and gender-based identity politics to which it is so consistently counterposed. As the 2011 labor struggles in Wisconsin so dramatically revealed, the U.S. labor movement's turn toward the state and electoral politics to secure its very right to exist mir mirrors the extreme difficulty of securing even minimal racial redistributive programs in the aftermath of the Great Society programs of the 1960s, which is to say that in an era of declining membership in mass-based labor and civil rights organizations, the prospects are dim for both a politics of race and a politics of class. Shifting the analytical focus from difference to domination directs our attention to the entanglement of race and superfluity as well as the racializing impact of violence, imprisonment, and warfare. Rejecting an understanding of capitalism as an increasingly inclusive engine of racial uplift and the state as an ultimate guarantor of civic equality, an abolitionist anti-racism would categorically reject the continuing affirmation of the fundamental respectability, pro respectability productivity, or patriotism of racialized groups as a way to determine the relative fitness for racial domination. Beginning from radically different histories of racialization, abolitionist anti-racist struggles would aim to dismantle the machinery of race at the heart of a fantasy of formal freedom 
for the limit point of capitalist equality is laid bare as the central protagonist of racial ordering.